From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on Middle East affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Fadi Nicholas Nassar, U.S. Lebanon Fellow at MEI and Director of the Institute for Social Justice, an Assistant Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the Lebanese American University. Today I'll be talking with the award-winning founder of the popular newsletter, Sa'adun and Nas, Dani Hajjar. Danny brings with him a diverse and electric background that weaves together a genuine love for music, culture, activism, advocacy, and diaspora engagement. In doing so, he helps amplify the intersections of all of these in Lebanon and the broader region. Thank you very much for being here with us, Danny. Thank you so much. I thought I'd start off this conversation with an introduction to some of our listeners who might not be too familiar with your newsletter. Can you tell us what inspired you to launch a newsletter in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again for having me here. Join y'all for this. This newsletter was kind of born out of a desire to showcase our different creative uh, musical talents. Um, I think a lot of the focus when it comes to Arabic music tends to be on Arab pop music for many understandable reasons. Um, It's catchy, it's danceable, it's nostalgic, but I had a desire to want to showcase all the other different genres and artists that are, you know, either in the Middle East, North Africa, or part of the diaspora that are also really doing some interesting music. Um, And I have been toying with that idea uh, to do that in 2020. Um, And then the Port of Beirut blast happened in August, and the focus of the newsletter kind of morphed just a bit to not only be about the music and the culture, but also um, to have a dedicated section every week to Lebanon and what's going on there. And I thought of it as a very, very small, small way to kind of make sure that people were aware of what was going on, how we were or weren't holding people accountable for what took place Um, and just all the different developments in the country. So it's a combination of things. And then later on, as the newsletter progressed, I wanted to do something where I could highlight different people within the community who are just doing really interesting things. But instead of asking them about their jobs or their careers, I wanted to ask them about their go-to music. And so I would ask them questions along the lines of, you know, What are some songs that you listen to uh, when you're feeling down? What are some songs that you know all the words to? And for me, it felt like that really humanized people that I admire, people that I think the community admires, and it brings some kind of a connection between all of us and that person through music, which I think is really, really cool. Thanks. No, fascinating stuff. Um, If you don't mind me asking, you mentioned the Port of Beirut, the blast of the Port of Beirut blast. What was it in particular that drove this general sense of advocacy for you and uplifting of some very important causes in Lebanon? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm Lebanese. My parents came to the U.S. during the Civil War. Um, so I'm a first generation American and Lebanon is very near and dear to my heart and who I am. And so that sense of activism had kind of been there since I was a child, really, we would go and stay five months out of the year um, in Lebanon for almost every year up until I was about 18 um, and started college. And so this was nothing new to me in terms of wanting to do something for the country, even though, you know, I would never compare myself to the to actual activists and organizers that are putting in the work every day. What I was trying to do was try to use my newsletter as a vehicle to show people who suddenly felt aware um, of what was going on in Lebanon or suddenly, you know, had started to pay a little bit of attention because of the blast. Um, I wanted to use that newsletter to keep the momentum going and just continue to educate and show people about what was going on in the country um, and what was going on with our people. So for me, that, that sense of activism has always kind of been there and it, was, I think, a little bit more formalized with the newsletter. 
And how have you found the reception to mixing music artistry with such advocacy? I think people appreciate it. I think people really appreciate the stories. Um, you know, the stories that I tend to include aren't explicitly political. I try not to include too many stories that are, you know, for example, oh, Lebanese parliament, you know, failed to elect a president for the 10th time. If you want that news, you can find it in many other venues. What I would want to try to do is say, you know, why is this community in Tripoli so affected by um, the compounding crises that are happening and try to humanize all the different political pieces that are that are going on. Those are the stories that kind of most interest me. Now, granted, the newsletter, I think, has its reputation and its fame for the music that I include, which I'm OK with. I think that's that's fair. And that was the original intention um, of the newsletter. And so I do appreciate the fact that people tend to go there for the different playlists, the different artists and, and everything in that realm. Um, but I do think it's a good mix and it's, it's something that I hope to continue doing. Something I find so interesting is the diverse audience and following you have. I mean, on my end, I see academics, music lovers, activists. Who, who have you felt you reach with the newsletter? Wow, that's a really good question. I feel like I've, I've reached people who just love music. And in that space, there are academics, there are other artists, there are chefs, there are activists, there are writers, journalists. I mean, it kind of really runs the gamut of professions that people have. And frankly, it runs the gamut of communities in terms of where they live. So one thing I really want to try to do with the newsletter, no matter what the content is, is to make sure that you know, it's not just people in the diaspora that feel connected to something, but that people living in the Middle East, North Africa feel like this is a, an accurate representation of what's going on and what's happening. And I want that I want them to also feel connected and through that kind of bridge different gaps or what have you between diaspora communities and uh, local communities. And so that's really been a highlight for me is to see you know, people living in Tunisia connect with people living in Australia who are connecting with people living in the UK and connecting with people living in Beirut. And so it's it's such a beautiful thing, I think, to kind of cultivate that that digital community. No, no, definitely. I, I want to switch over a bit to, I guess, a good segue is always Feirouz. You, you have a clear appreciation for Feirouz, as so many of us do. At such a time, and I know it's one of those things that words can never fully capture and, and at times can come off as trite. But what is it about Feirouz for you that stands out or that inspired at least the title? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The title of the newsletter, Sa'alun in Nes, which translates pretty much to the people asked me, right, felt so apt for this newsletter. Now, whether or not people asked me to do a newsletter or not is a whole other question, admittedly. But, uh, you know, in a way, I, I didn't want to stick with something that was like, here's the news or here's the music. It just felt very it felt it felt right that the title of the newsletter also be, you know, a song title um, by, you know, one of my favorite songs by Feirouz. And with her, she's such a revered person in Lebanon, you could argue probably in the broader region too. She's also this kind of mythological figure in a way, which I just find so fascinating about her. I think there's a whole, I'm not quite sure the word that I'm looking for right now, but there's this whole character of who she is and what she represents. And so, you know, I think she's just a fascinating artist in our history. And, you know, I think the the title just made a lot of sense to, to do it that way. And it's someone that everybody, whether you're young or old or what have you, listen to Arabic music or don't listen to Arabic music, you can kind of see why the title of the newsletter is what it is. Certainly. And are there any new artists in Lebanon right now that capture in their own way a similar spirit? Uh, you mean in terms of kind of this mythological sort of sense? Is that what you mean? Maybe, of course, not to the same levels as Feirouz, but that music can be something that transcends a lot of problems and challenges and gives hope and meaning and belonging. 
Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think there is an artist like that. Now that's not to say that, that artists, you know, that there aren't any good artists out there currently and that we should only listen to Feiruz. That's not at all what I mean, but I think what Feiruz did, the era she came up with, or she came up in, excuse me, and you know, what was happening in Lebanon at the time, particularly around the civil war and what Feiruz chose to do and chose not to do, for example, I don't know that we've had someone like that in recent memory. I think she she offers a lot of nostalgia to a lot of people. And the power of nostalgia is so great that at least right now, I don't know that I can say there is anybody. Maybe in 50, 60, 70 years, who knows if someone will point back to a current artist and say, you know what, this is my Feiruz. But at the moment, I think Feiruz is just such a unique artist character really in Lebanese history and in the history of the region because she did do quite a few songs for for Palestine as well and I I want to acknowledge that but I would say you know she, she is just someone that has transcended that to the point where political leaders meet with her for for PR purposes and things like that and there's a reason behind why that that happens right so yeah, I can't I can't think of an artist currently, but who's to who's to say that that artist can't exist, you know? No, no, certainly. I understand the the icon status of Feirouz and as you put it, uh, the particular period, the nostalgic period. But perhaps let me rephrase the question. We're also at a defining point in history in Lebanon right now, a, a, po- a moment that saw pain, that saw revolution, that saw injustice different, you know, very radically different emotions over the past few years. I'm wondering about the music scene in the past few years, in the past three years in particular, since 2019. Have you noticed or has something stood out to you about the songs, the artistry that, or the music that has come out in this time? That's a good question. I think around the you know, Tauda in 2019, in October. Obviously, I think there was a, quite a bit of hope and quite a bit of ju- jubilation. And so what I noticed, at least in the protests that were happening across the country, is you had a lot of people gravitate toward sort of electronic music, a lot of house music, which tends to be something that Lebanon and Beirut in particular is known for bringing in these DJs and doing house music. That's a genre that's very popular, obviously, in the country. And so you had a kind of a continuation of that. And you had sort of different chants against political leaders be remixed into house songs and have a thumping beat in the background, which I thought was very cool. Since that time, and I think particularly since the blast in August 2020, you know, a lot of the sort of more popular artists, I think they've shied away from doing hopeful music in that way. And frankly, I think they've shied away from from really talking about politics, which I don't think, you know, you can have an opinion one way or another about what that looks like. But some of the bigger artists, I mean, I'm talking at the levels of like Nancy Ajram, Rehab Alemi, like those those folks, I think have shied a little bit away from getting too explicitly involved or saying anything publicly. That being said, I think what we have seen is a burgeoning indie scene where artists, I think, are, are not shy to call out political leader is not shy to call out the horrific collapse of the country. Um, and I think you've got, you know, rappers and MCs, you know, hip hop is a, is a genre of protest. And so naturally I think you have, you know, those artists in Lebanon who are rapping, who are doing that, creating music to kind of reflect that situation. Um, I think blue Pfeiffer is a great example of that. She was someone who came out with a song called, and it was just literally a recap of, I think it was 2020 and just how horrible 2020 was for, for Lebanese and just calling that, calling that out. And so you definitely have artists that are doing that in that way. But I think some of the bigger artists 
are not. And that is, I think, the difference between, for example, someone like Feruz, who was a massive artist, who still is a massive artist, frankly. She was the number two streamed artist in the region uh, on Spotify, which says something about her music. But, you know, you have someone at that level who is singing about these different situations and uh, and that sort of thing, and especially with, you know, her collaborations with Ziad Rahbani, who he clearly is not shy <laughs> about talking about those situations and musically and, and calling things out. Compare that to the artists today that would be considered at that same sort of level in terms of pop music and popular music, they're not necessarily doing that. And so you have to kind of look towards some of the more, I don't want to say niche genres, but genres that aren't getting as much maybe attention in Lebanon as they should be. You look to those artists, for example, to, to kind of make that, to kind of make sense of the situation musically. Any artists you want to give a particular shout out to? Oh, Yeah. I want to give a shout big. I mean, I gave her a big shout out, but I love Blue Pfeiffer. I think Blue Pfeiffer is one of the most fascinating rappers to come out of Lebanon. Um, Nuj and UJ is also another one that I want to give a big shout out to. Really, anyone that is working with Beirut City Records, like I want to give them a shout out. They're they're doing a lot of really interesting hip hop right now, and so I would definitely give them all a shout out. You mentioned DC. How about the Lebanese music artistry in the diaspora? Are there more bridges emerging between, let's say, Lebanon and the diaspora or some new divides that are materializing? Musically, you mean? Musically, collaborate in terms of collaboration, engagement with one another, visions of Lebanon. Yeah, I don't think it has happened yet, or at least not on the level that you see other communities do it. You know, for example... I think you see that happen far more in the Sudanese music scene, uh, particularly with Sudanese hip hop, than you do in, in the Lebanese music scene. I think you see that a little bit more with the Palestinian music scene, for example. So it hasn't really happened yet for what I imagine would be a variety of different reasons, but it would be cool to see that. I mean, I'm all for collaboration. I'm all for all of us kind of working together and creating really cool music and interesting music. So you know, I'm sure at some point it'll happen. It just hasn't, it has not really materialized as of yet. L let me ask you, how do you find yourself living in Washington and engaging with core causes in Lebanon? Some of them that inspired you to start this newsletter. Yeah. I mean, what's nice is there is a good contingent. Um, there's a good contingent of Lebanese diaspora in the DC, Maryland and Virginia area. And so you know, it's it's being part of those different groups, being plugged into kind of what's happening, seeing where I can be useful in terms of how I can be supportive. But really, too, it's it's being connected with friends and family in Lebanon directly, hearing from them and seeing what's going on and how you know we can be most helpful, how we can um, ensure that what we're doing is actually making a positive impact. Um, you know, I think for me, at least first and foremost, what I try to do is to focus on my family um, and see kind of what's what's going on with, with them and where I can be supportive of them. Because at the end of the day, I think that's what we all in the diaspora tend to focus on. And, and I think that's a good start is focusing on our families and, and seeing what's uh, where we can all be helpful and kind of seeing where the most personal impact um, is happening. Powerful words. To that, let me let me just ask a question about the larger diaspora in terms of a more regional outlook, whether in Washington or in the United States. Have you felt your newsletter helps bring together different communities, engage one another with music, artistry? I'm just curious if you've got any of that feedback. Yeah, I definitely think I, I definitely think it has, even if it's on a very small level, you know, I've, I, I've gotten emails from people that I don't know, <laughs> emails from people that I do know who have told me, oh my gosh, this is so cool that this person in you know San Francisco is doing this. I live in Paris and I want to help them. Or, you know, oh my gosh, I would have never known about this really cool thing that's happening in Cairo. I want to learn more about it. I'm living in Orlando, Florida, like things like that is I've gotten that feedback and it's really cool. That to me feels 
incredibly rewarding to see how people across different countries and communities are finding ways to connect with each other through this newsletter or finding ways to relate to each other through this newsletter. I mean, that to me is just, it's a beautiful thing. And I love to see that. I love to find ways to bring us all together in that way and to find some sense of connection between between all of us. Um, and music is a powerful connector. Certainly. Y- your newsletter you know, certainly transcends Lebanon. Are there any cross-cutting themes that you've noticed in some of the new artistry that is coming out in the past few years and music in the region? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, I tend to listen to a lot of rap and hip hop. So I think you're seeing a lot of artists experiment more with the beat structures than I think you had in the past. Like, for example, you're seeing a lot of drill music happening. North African artists, I think in particular, are doing a lot of Afrobeats music and collaborating with um, East African and West African artists, which I think is very fascinating. I think you're seeing kind of a a really cool period of time for uh, Iraqi rap, for example. So there are things that, that kind of are taking place that just from my vantage point, I'm, I'm starting to notice. But at the end of the day, I think what's really cool is that we're all doing something really interesting. Every community is cr- trying to do something really cool. Um, and I think on some level, you're seeing artists from different communities collaborate with each other. And that is at the end of the day, one of the coolest things. I think that that is, that's what I've noticed. And, you know, it's, it's fun to watch. If you don't mind me asking, is there any particular sort of new music that is emerging from, let's say, within the diaspora community in the United States or outside? Yeah, I think you're starting to see a lot of diaspora artists incorporate both English and Arabic into their music which I don't, I can't say that I have seen too much of before when I was growing up and everything and, uh, and seeing that and listening to music. So you're seeing younger artists now like Bayou and you're seeing artists like St. Levant, you're seeing artists uh, like Lana Lubani who are all finding ways to incorporate Arabic that way along with English. Um, And they're doing very well. I mean, they're very successful at it. So I think it's, And they're successful at it, not just within the diaspora communities, right? They're successful at it just with a general audience. And so I think that's been a really cool thing to see is more and more people uh, be exposed to the Arabic language in that way and be exposed to our music in that way. I think Fauzia is also another one that, that does that really well. There are a lot, and I'm sure I'm missing quite a few people, but you know, I think that is something that I, I've started to notice is to hear more Arabic mixed in with English. And I think that's very reflective of uh, a lot of experiences in the diaspora as us, you know, using multiple languages to communicate. Now you're hearing that reflected in the music. I think that's a really, really important thing. And I'm curious, is that well received? Does it travel back to their respective home communities? I think it is well received. I mean, I, you know, some of these artists are going uh, and performing uh, at some of the, you know, bigger music conferences and festivals. Um, most recently, the ones that happened in uh, Dubai and in Riyadh, like you're seeing some of these diaspora artists, you know, participate there and uh, being part of that. And so, you know, I think it is happening. And I think a lot of that too has to do with some of the, the previous sort of, artists that pay, that paved the way for these newer artists to come through. So I'm talking about guys like Narsi and Omar Fendum and, you know, these folks who, you know, they were among the first to do it and they were among the only ones really to do it. And now you're seeing a plethora of artists start to do it. And I think, you know, them too and others uh, really paved the way for, for this new generation to kind of take hold. And so I do think you are seeing that well-received kind of, uh, back in in the region as well Mm -hmm. i've got to ask it's the end of the year uh who was on your top three three list the spotify wrap up (laughs) oh man uh well drake was number one for me (laughs) which uh people can make of that what they will um bad bunny was number two for me also people can make of that what they will and then uh, a good friend of mine who put out her first 
album this year. Her name is Nadina Ruby. She is a Sudanese artist and she does really, really cool kind of R&B and very sultry sort of music. And so they were my top three artists on Spotify this year. That's amazing. Shout out to her. Um, hope we can find a way to, to amplify her new album. Congratulations. All right. With that, uh, thank you so much for your time, Danny. It's wonderful talking to you. Any last words you might have for our listeners? I just want to say thank you again for, for this opportunity. It was really cool to be here, really cool to, to chat with you about music and kind of the happenings and everything. And please subscribe to the newsletter if you haven't already. And if you've got any feedback, I would love to hear it or any suggestions for any folks to sort of guest feature. Uh, I'm all ears. So I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you for your time and congrats again on your award. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support. Thank you.